This is the fifth day of the December 2005 seven-day retreat in Springwater. thought comes up that that's the hardest part of the talk to remember. The sequence of the days. It feels very natural just sit, to relax, and not to worry about where one is. Is it early in the retreat, or late, or in the middle? If one's planning the kitchen or has a job that where these facts are important, then, then it has relevance. But if the capacity to compare, to analyze, to measure isn't needed, and that's clearly seen. Can it be allowed to fall by the wayside? A puff of wind and the snow that perches on the branch of a pine flies off. Where does it go? What does it become? There's snow on the branch and there isn't, and there's this white powder in the air, and there isn't. Is there any becoming? Thought says, of course, I can remember the way it was before. I can reason. From memory. From knowledge. The trajectory. of this becoming that. But in the moment of direct observation, in the depths of quiet listening, Does this become that? Or is it all here? 
as it is, without blemish, without lack. What came to mind to look at this morning was this matter of me, of thinking of myself as a me, of picturing this me. As somebody said last night, as being this edifice. thinking of oneself as inside this edifice, this structure. And immediately something else came up, and a memory, or many memories of people asking in meetings, What is it about all of this emphasis at this place, in these meetings and talks about the me? It's confusing. I think the underlying question is, is why? Why question something that seems so integral, so natural, as being a me, a person, with my life, my interests, my likes and dislikes, I was reading recently in, in, the, in the most recent Atlantic Monthly, a neuro, I think a neuropsychologist, and his colleagues have, have really been studying this, this, what he calls a natural dualism, and showing with ex ex experimental experiments with children, with babies, how quickly we, we gravitate to seeing this, ourselves as separate, separate beings from the body and from what we call our physical surroundings. We can see a tree and we feel we can predict. We have a certainty about what a tree is, the shape and the growth. We can see a rock and a mountain. And we can also see this, this other world of memory and thought, of emotion, of desire. 
and, and, and the ability to, to, through imagination, to attain that which is desire. And seeing this, seeing this continuity, this sense of continuity, as something that is not the world of the rock or the tree. The predictable physical world. This mutable and changeable world and yet continuous world of the me. An example came to mind in the in the sitting round this morning. I was just home for home to my mother's house. It's interesting, it came up so quickly. What home is. That, that feeling of continuity. It was just to my mother's apartment. And she mentioned something about an incident that occurred when I was nine or ten, having an injury on the way into school. Not a bad, but a, but a very bloody injury. And she was called into the nurse's office, and, and my teacher was called in, and she was surprised that my teacher didn't know who this student was. And the teacher later apologized and said, well, he's so quiet, never says anything, and I, I have so many students. Some other things were said. But looking back at this, there, there is this sense of identity, of being a quiet person, the one who stands to the back, It really formed, for whatever reason, and, and was reinforced. And I remember even later in life, becoming more social, going to parties, and yet in the back of the mind there was always kind of a, a measuring that, is this, is this really real? Is this kind of a fraud, being so talkative? because I'm a quiet person. So there was this real sense of this and, and many other things, characteristics, memories, as having existed before, existing now, through, through time, through remembered time, and that these things gelling into something that constituted me. distinct and personal, for better or for worse, to be either defended or to be overcome.
Sometimes in, in when somebody suggests or or implies that this is something to be questioned, part of the resistance is that and it's this, this little phrase that's going going around nowadays in the political world, that we'd like to cherry pick the good meat, the good parts, and change and change the uncomfortable parts, the parts that don't work so well. And I wonder if, if in all honesty, that isn't what initially was part of the motivation to begin meditative work. To feel better. Not to fundamentally and radically question the stuff that one believed to be true. This may, this may not be a complete picture, but there, there's, there's definitely some of that, 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 yeah, the questioning is okay, but not to, not to go too far with it. Because protecting this this sense of, of being someone is, is almost integral with, 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 with feeling oneself to be separate, unique, and ongoing. In the ongoing, There's almost, there is, a natural concomitant that there's the fear that this will come to an end. So this maintain, maintenance of this feeling of separation is almost vital, because we know that this This stuff, this, this matter, which we call a body, will deteriorate and drop away. Or maybe it'll drop away without deteriorating. But imagination can project something from memory into an infinite, what it calls infinite future, in which something, some trace of this me will survive. Probably part of this third grade memory was, was remembering a, a very familiar Emily Dickinson poem where she she talks about never I never saw the sea, I never saw a moor, I never saw the sea. But in her imagination, fueled by literature or conversation, she has a, a picture of, of the heather, of the ocean, of the waves, and she follows. And I'm approximating, I don't have the exact, obviously, words. I never talked with God, I never visited heaven. But again, she was so certain 
the imaginative picture was so vivid that, that this existed, that was in assumption, if you will, or a leap of faith, that what the mind can picture can be fairly accurate. And therefore, if the... And I'm, please, I'm not trying to interpret the poem. They have much more subtle and profound meanings. But for, for just for the moment, for this, for this looking, that if we can picture this, this future that I'm included in, then it has to be If we can picture God's and supernatural beings, then they too must be in the sense that this, this mind is so, so capable of picturing something that it would like, a house, a table, Car, and outlining the steps that are necessary to get to get the car, to get the house, to, rent, to invent the car. And to make the picture to feel that one is making the picture into something that exists in this real, in this physical world. That that effort, that picturing, that planning, the studying, the perhaps years of studying, working, saving, scheming, and planning, is the proof that this me exists, that it, that it can create and obtain what it wants. And in this, in this protective web, There's a real sense that this needs to be defended, that the me can, can exist and coexist with others, it can expand to those it shares common interests with, a common race or ethnicity, those identifiable characteristics that look like they're part of this me world. Common religion, history, belief, political belief. And it can also identify that which is outside. The ones who are the others, who are not as good, who don't have the right religion, the right political beliefs, that don't drive the right cars or live the right way. So there's an elaborate defense department created to defend what is me and mine, to de define what isn't, to 
keep these things straight, orderly, and to maintain security, which can never be maintained. Just, just crossed the mind this morning, marveling at how much energy, intelligence, money, creativity of a sort, goes into the invention of weapons. Weapons of mass destruction, call them. Or of very precise destruction, smart bombs. When we take out a few at a time, a few buildings, a few people, amazing just how much effort goes into securing what in the common phrase is our way of life, or in attacking that. subverting it. And yet nothing is secured. We still walk on the same shaky ground. Is, isn't, that, isn't that so that this that this me which, which thrives so on on reassurance is never really totally reassured that there's always an incompleteness. One moment we bask in the sun of someone's praise and yet there's almost already a little doubt are they being sincere? Are they laying on a little too thick? Do they want something? So this thing that's built up and that's carried and continued, takes a lot of replenishing, reassuring, So, if this is called into question, not because it's the right thing to do, because of something one has read, some, someone one takes to be an authority says that this is the way, to understanding, Or to a higher state. Or to becoming a better self or a better me. But if, if there's some sense of how insecure, how tentative, and how isolating, isolating and isolated this sense of being a separate little person, little me, is. In some traditions they, they talk about the small me or the small self. can't get a clear picture of this, but it's small in the sense that it's not the whole. Not in a, not in a relative sense. Because a lot of times this me feels pretty big. Taking up all the space.
So beginning to just touch without the need to overcome, to go to war. I remember going to a retreat once and saying, the, 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 uh, well, what was the coordinator saying? That this, this is not a retreat. This is a war. And I'm going to war against this ego. Not, not, not those exact words, but close enough. So I'm wondering if there's a different possibility not to, to go to war. Because who's going to war? Who battles the me? I'm wondering if there's a possibility to look, to understand, and to question what's actually going on from moment to moment, and not to deny anything, to see, just to see this in operation, what we're calling, for the lack of a better word, a me or a separate self, to watch it, to watch. Whatever goes on, whatever's here. The thought coming in or coming up, I am this or that, I'm hurt, I'm angry, this is just the way I am. And looking <laughs> freshly, Is this true? Is this, is this, is this the whole picture? My needs, my wants. Not to say it, it is this way or it isn't this way, to deny, but allowing an incredible space for watching. And if possible at times without without further ado, without judging, oh how awful I I only think about myself. Well if that's the case, and it is for most of us most of the time, does it have to be how awful or can it just be seen? Yeah, there it is. And in the scene, in this kind of scene, which doesn't take sides, it doesn't, it doesn't have to expand into a problem, into a new me. The bad me, the deficient me, just seeing, yeah, all these thoughts are coming to, to something that's being called me. That sees itself as, as the center. And wondering if that has to be. If it is, in fact, the true state of affairs. If there is, in fact, someone who sits apart,
stands apart, thinks of itself as a part, separate and individual and unique. For at this moment, in a quiet room, feeling warm, sun on the eyes, breathing, listening, all of the senses together, does this thought even come up? I am doing this. There is something being done and therefore there is someone doing it. Or is there simply a quiet room, a quiet body? Even the words seem something somewhat extra. A creaking chair. And the intensity and depth and beauty of quiet listening. We'll end the talk here.